Jean, for the nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, today, I would like to go over some common mistakes that I see uh, people make with estate planning and in general, the mistakes they make with not organizing their life details. So that was one of the reasons why I wrote my book is that, and I will share stories, I've noticed that there's people tend to concentrate on one area and tend to not um, organize other important life details. So I'm going to go over um, some common uh, mistakes that you can prevent. So first of all, <clears throat> I wouldn't be an attorney unless I had a disclaimer. Um, really, this information is just general. And I love this quote, it's generally correct, but may be specifically wrong for your situation. So oftentimes in these types of presentations, folks want to talk about very personal situations and their particular case. I'd rather not get into really personal details because we're in a forum, a public forum here. And I'd rather not, uh, the, the questions I'd have to ask to get enough information to give you a, a, a good answer would take a long time. And it you know, I respect your privacy. So I'd rather keep that private. And if you have specific questions for your particular um, situation, just please reach out to me um, directly and you have my um, you have my contact information. And of course, this is not considered um, legal advice. I'm not your attorney, <clears throat> et cetera. Okay, so with that out of the way, um, you know, I'd like to first talk about your personal audit. So I'm assuming most folks on the call, you, you probably already have an estate plan. You probably already have a living trust. From what I could gather, most of you are from California. Some of my information in this presentation is California specific. So I apologize if it doesn't apply to you, but some will be very California specific and some will just be more general. Um, information. <clears throat> so the areas that I highlight are these areas. So vital records, estate planning, financial planning, health, final wishes, family archives, and emergency planning. And I'm going to go through each of these and talk about what items that you may want to consider um, organizing. So the goal here is to put this these pieces together and have a cohesive plan and avoid some common mistakes that folks make. <clears throat> now, first of all, what are your advisors missing? So I know most of you on the call probably have financial advisors. You, you may have an estate planning attorney. You may use a CPA. You know, we all have advisors that we do use and they're very good at what they do, but their focus is very narrow in their particular area. So most even though you do have these, these sets of advisors, oftentimes there's missing pieces and it's not cohesive. So that's one of my goals and missions is to make things more cohesive and to have an overall plan that takes those missing pieces and makes them makes your plan more cohesive. So I'm gonna start with um, vital records and you know, you probably think, well, what does it matter? You know, my vital records, why are you talking about that? So th the first reason is that um, it's important to make sure that you have this information when you need it. So primary forms of ID. So of course, your driver's license, your passport, your social security number, your social security card. So you want to make sure that um, you have copies of all those documents and that you have those documents, the originals in an emergency file. So if something happened and you needed, like for example, here near my house, you know, we had the fires. And so we were almost going to be evacuated. And I had my emergency, I have a, a, a case that I, I grab and go. And so I had all our passports, all our social security cards, all those vital records and lots of other things in this box that I it has a handle and I take it and go. <clears throat> so the first set, you wanna make sure that you have all of those documents and you have copies. So your passport, where is it located? And when does it expire? I can't tell you how many times clients tell me, oh, I'm, I'm gonna go on an international trip and they've realized their passport expires in a month. Well, guess what? I mean, it's, you know, of course, as you know, it can take six weeks to get a new passport. So, you know, it's good to keep track of those things. Your social security card, where is it located? Where's the original?
So oftentimes I'm at court and I'm waiting in line. Someone needs a copy of their divorce documents. And believe it or not, um, divorce documents um, you may need in the future when you're applying for Social Security benefits or I had another client who was trying to get her real ID and she needed her divorce judgment to show the, the, um, the DMV proof that she was divorced. So it's important to have those types of documents and have a copy and that should be in your file as well. And then another thing, if you're a veteran, I would strongly encourage you to find your DD-214, the honorable discharge document because there are benefits that are available for veterans. And that's the first thing they're gonna ask for is your for your DD-214. So I would suggest that you find that document. And then other, um, that would be name change documents. So if you've ever done a name change, you know, have copies of this. So why I added this and why I have this in my book is oftentimes I know you'll, you'll watch TV in the news and a big tragedy happens. And, you know, there's a fire, there's, you know, a flood and people lose everything. But if they had one of these emergency kits, they would have had those documents. And if they see the flood, if they have time, they can grab it and go. So that kind of inspired me to tell people, well, you know, you should at least have your basic documents organized in case something happens. Okay. So next I'm going to go over estate planning. and. Um, Oftentimes, you know, I'll meet with clients who they've done their estate planning, you know, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, and they want to amend their documents. Oftentimes, they don't understand how these documents work together. They don't understand what the roles of folks are, what the importance of funding is. So I'd like to just go over that. So I know most of you prob probably already have these documents, but I'd like to just do a little refresher <clears throat> about that. So first of all, um, I think it's important for everyone to review your living trust and pour over will. So first of all, who have you named as your trustee? Who's your executor of your pour over will? Are they still willing to serve? Are they still able to serve? Are they older? And this would not be a good job for them. Um, this is an excellent time to review the choices you've made um, the other thing you want to review is you have a primary and how many alternates do you have? And those folks that you have as alternates, are they able to serve? Are they good choices? And finally, and most importantly, have you talked to them and they know that they've been named as a trustee? I can't tell you how many clients tell me, oh, I'll just name, you know, I'll just name Sally. She's fine. Well, no one wants to be surprised as the trustee of your trust when something happens to you. So make sure that they're still willing to serve in that role. <clears throat> now, distribution, um, you know, I'd like to, you know, of course you want to review, you know, how you've distributed your estate and look at the sections and decide whether that's still appropriate. And I suggest once a year, you should look at your estate planning documents and determine whether they're still represent your wishes. Now, I don't know how many folks may have minor children or have children with special needs, but this is a good time to review what provisions that you have in your documents to make sure that your kids are protected and that if you have children with special needs, that they're protected as well. So this is an excellent time to review all of that. And the mistake that I see folks do and you know it's we, we're all very busy we all have a lot going on in our lives but oftentimes we create these documents which is great i mean you know i i applaud that you know it's excellent to have your state planning documents but then people don't look at them you know for 10 years later you know 10 years down the line then they look at them again so i mean i strongly suggest try to look at your state planning documents maybe once a year just review it just to make sure that everything's up to date um, the next thing, of course, is funding. So um, funding is just another word for retitling assets into the trust. Now, I'm assuming that many of you may have um, real properties, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. Um, 
oftentimes I meet with clients and they don't understand the difference between a deed of trust and a grant deed, a quick claim deed, trust, you know, they don't understand the differences between all those documents. So I'd like to just spend a few moments on that. So, you know, of course, when you purchase a home, you you receive what's called a grant deed. And that I I, I kind of equate that with a title of a car. It's, it's like the, the title. It's like who owns it. You may have a mortgage, but you are the owner of the property. Now, the grant deed shows how it's titled. It may be titled in your as you, community properties, right of survivorship, my joint tenancy. You know, it's, it's good to look at how your property is titled. And that is um, a copy you should have that document in your files at all times that you know, you know, what the current title is. Now, the difference between the grant deed and the deed of trust is the deed of trust is your mortgage. So folks think that the deed of trust is a title, but that's the mortgage part of it. So those two documents work in conjunction. And it's important to know the difference and to have those documents in your file so that you know, you know exactly how your property is titled. Now, when you do have a trust, and if you do own real property, I would strongly suggest that you have a living trust to avoid probate. Um, that title will be prop titled in the name of the trust. And so typically, you know, attorneys will prepare what's called a trust transfer deed or a quick claim deed, transferring it from your individual name to the name of the trust. And having it titled in the trust will avoid probate. So it's already titled in the trust. There's no reason to go to probate to, to administer that or transfer ownership of that property because it's already titled. Now, um, one other thing, and I, I just want to bring this up, and those of you who are not in California or who do not own real property in California, this will not apply to you, but there has been a recent change. Uh, it was about two, three years ago, um, Prop 19 was enacted. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with that. So unfortunately, it has changed our ability to transfer our tra our tax, our property tax basis to our children. So in the past, it, we were governed by Prop 58, which would allow us to transfer that property tax basis to our children when we die. Well, Prop 19 changed that. Prop 19 changed two things. So Prop 19 does allow you to transfer up to $1 million of your property tax basis to your children if it's their primary residence and it was your primary residence. So it's very important if you have children and you're going to transfer property, real property to your children, I would encourage you to make sure that your homeowner's exemption is current on your property. So the homeowner's exemption, if you look on your property bill, there's a line item that says homeowner's exemption, $7,000. It does a few things for you. And one important thing it does is it would allow you to transfer your property tax basis to your children up to that million dollars. It also saves you about $80 a year on your property tax, which isn't as significant, but it's something. Um, so I would suggest that you review and make sure that you do have the homeowner's exemption um, on your property. Um, the, you know, there's Prop 19. It also allows you, which is good in my opinion, you can transfer your property tax basis to any other state in California. So in the past, it was really complicated to do that. If you're over 55, you could transfer it to other counties but it depended if that county would recognize it. And so there were only certain counties that would allow that. Prop 19 changed that. So I had a client, they moved from Cupertino to Monterey, uh, you know, Santa Clara County to Monterey County. And they, I was able to help them transfer their property tax basis. They bought a new home, a replacement home in Monterey County. And they, that it transferred perfectly over to Monterey County. They have that wonderful property tax basis in Monterey County. So it worked really well for them. So that's, you know, that can be helpful. But the part of Prop 19 that is a bit controversial and can cause some problems 
is the inability to transfer the property tax basis to your children. Now, I'm not getting political here, but if it's something that you're interested in finding out more about, the Howard Jarvis Association is trying to get that law changed, and you can visit their website if you want to learn more about what they're doing to change the property transfer tax rules. Now, the last thing with real property, um, when you created a trust, um, you know, you do want to add, I would suggest you may want to consider adding the trust as an additional insured on your homeowner's policy. So you may want to review to see if you've done that. Um, so since, you, you know, if you're transferring your property into the trust, I like that to match the property, the homeowner's insurance. And I would suggest that you may want to consider adding the trust as an additional insured on your homeowner's policy. Um, <clears throat> now, funding. Of course, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, I mean, this is just a very short list. Um, you do, especially if you have any bank accounts or brokerage accounts that are close or over the probate limit, you'll wanna make sure that you've added the trust to that account. Um, in the alternative, you can name beneficiaries, but it kind of depends on your situation. Um, and then beneficiary driven assets, this is huge. So I, I really encourage all of you to look at your IRAs, 401ks, you know, life insurance, make sure that you've named primary beneficiaries and contingent beneficiaries, um, you know, and make sure that those are up to date. Um, the last thing that you'd want to happen is an ex-spouse receives your life insurance policy proceeds. That would be quite awkward for your new spouse. So make sure that um, you check those on a regular basis. Um, that's a big mistake that people make. They don't realize, well, I have a trust, you know, the trust, everything follows the trust. They don't realize, well, if it's a beneficiary driven asset, they're going to follow who, who's named um, as the beneficiary. And I always like to have a primary and a contingent named. Um, distribution of personal items. Um, this, you know, some folks have collections. Like I had a client who had a, you know, a 1968, you know, it's a fancy, uh, I'm not into cars, but a, a 1968 Mustang. And it was very important that that went to a particular person. If you have items like that and you want that to be distributed to a particular person, or you, if you, if you have collections or something that's very significant for you, you know, it's important to make sure you make those provisions so that that person receives those items. Now, um, also review, I would review the your durable power of attorney. And most importantly, make sure that you've named agents and that you have successor agents. Now, this is a great document to have. It only goes into effect if you become incapacitated. But the mistake that I see clients make is that they have this document in place, but then the agent doesn't have any information about their assets or, or any of their, your, their debts. And so they're walking into this blindly trying to figure out this person's financial situation. So, you know, that's one of the things that I talk about a lot is making sure that information is organized. So in the event that you become incapacitated, the person who steps in, it can be easy and they know what to do and they know how to solve problems. Now, how do these work? These documents work together? Um, I, I get that question a lot because why do we need my, the first question is always, if I have a living trust, why do I need a pour of a will? You know, and, and it's very counterintuitive. Why would you have both documents? So really those two documents work together. So in the event that you passed away and you did not have you know, your assets or a, an asset that was over the probate limit um, titled in the trust, we can correct that by using the pour over will and getting it poured over into the trust. So that's why you have both. And you know, I do apologize. You've probably already heard this before, but lots of times I have folks that come in, they don't really understand how this all works together. And so that's an important component. And then, of course, your financial power of attorney, you know, that, you know, in the event that you become incapacitated, your agent can pay your bills, file your taxes and and take care of items. Now, I would suggest, you know, especially if you have items titled into the trust, 
that you have the same individuals named as the trustee, the executor, and the financial power of attorney. I think it makes it much easier. And because you will have um, sections in your trust that will reference the financial power of attorney, and it just makes it easier to have the same individuals in those same um, roles. So the next question is, um, the more practical questions. So, you know, it's great to have all these documents, but what if your, your trustee cannot find the document? So I had a client and the trust, the individual passed away. They were looking everywhere for the originals. I mean, everywhere in this house it was a big house and they looked in every closet, could not find it. Believe it or not, they found it in a box in a bathroom. So, you know, it's important that people know where your documents are. I mean, this client must have spent weeks looking for this, you know, because we do need, it's best to have the originals, really needed the original. And it was really a hassle to try to have to find this. So, you know, I really think it's good and it, it caused the trustee a lot of stress. It's good that you let them know where you have the originals located. And most attorneys, you know, like I give the originals to the client, I keep a digital copy. So most times the, the client will have the original documents. The other important component is, is like I said, you, you always need a digital copy. So I would always suggest that you make sure that it gets scanned and that you talk to your attorney about how it's going to be stored. Um, of course, you know, my practice is to use a service and it's encrypted and the client can access those digital copies whenever they need those. Um, and then also sometimes people forget, like they amend the documents and then they don't have a copy of the amendment. So it's very important to make sure that um, you have, you know, access to all amendments because you may amend your trust you know, over time, as your kids get older, you know, it's very common to amend trust and make your children trustees or change distributions or, you know, all those types of things. So, you know, that's another part of the planning is just to make sure that you have physical and digital copies of, of any and all amendments. Um, so the next portion is the financial information. So, um, of course, this most clients are pretty organized, but I think it's important to have lists and files of all your financial information. So bank accounts and brokerage accounts. And then um, I put a circle in there for significant life events. So if someone gets divorced or someone passes away, it's important to look at those accounts and make sure that they're properly titled. Um, and if it's a beneficiary driven asset, make sure that, you know, the beneficiaries are updated as well. Um, the next part of it is risk management. So we all have, you know, lots of these types of policies, the homeowners, the car insurance, the umbrella, you know, all these different types of um, insurances. I think it's important to keep a list I prefer to have files um, of each of these policies. You can have it either physical or digital, but in you know definitely have all of this information handy for your trustee or your agent in the event that you become incapacitated. I think when you're reviewing your estate plan and all your financial information, this is a perfect time to review your coverage. So talk to your your um property casualty person, you know, what, what are my homeowners limits? Should I increase those? Are they too, are the, should I decrease them? You know, do I need earthquake insurance? Do I need flood insurance? You know, this is a great time just to review these types of policies once a year um, and make sure that they are sufficient to cover, um, you know, cover you in case, you know, something happens. Um, the umbrella policy, I consider that a very important type of insurance. It does um, allow for additional coverage. So for example, I had a client and they had quite a number of properties and, you know, they had renters. And I said, well, do you have umbrella insurance? And, you know, they, they 
you know, looked into that because they had so many properties. And so that's really your first line of defense is having, you know, umbrella policies to help prevent, um, you know, to, to have coverage. Another example was I had a client and I suggested umbrella and then, then a, gosh, it must have been like six months later, he caused an accident and he hit someone head on and it caused head injuries for this person. And he just called me. He said, thank you so much because I didn't have umbrella until I talked to you. And then I got an umbrella policy. And that was very important because, you know, I caused this accident and this person had pretty major injuries. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of insurance, but, you know, it's something that, you know, you may just want to look into, you know, it's just something to help mitigate risk. The other thing, if you have minor children or young drivers on your policy, you may want to consider an umbrella policy. Quite frankly, that's kind of one of our biggest risks is, is car accidents, you know, because we move, you know, car, it's easy to get into a car accident. And having that additional insurance may be helpful. Um, the other type of insurance I just wanted to touch on briefly is long-term care insurance. So I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with what happened in Washington recently. So they did um, implement a state-mandated long-term care insurance um, policy uh, uh, long-term, it's like mandated long-term care. And so what happened is they implemented this law. And if you did not want to be part of the state solution for long-term care, you had to opt out. And in order to opt out, you had to get your own private policy. So what's interesting about this, a lot of people really scrambled to opt out of the state option because they didn't want the state involved in their long-term care. And so they were scrambling to buy their own long-term care policy so they could opt out. The unfortunate part about Washington was that they did not give people a lot of time. And so what's interesting about this is California is looking at the same option about, um, you know, it's still in the task force committee section, but they are looking at this where if you did not want the state option for long-term care, you would have to opt out by buying a private policy. So it's something I just wanted to talk about just so it's on your radar. You know, it may or may not happen here in California. It's interesting though, it is, there are about 12 other states that are thinking of implementing this kind of a policy. And you could have a whole speaker talking about long-term care. This is going to be a very hot topic um, in the next coming years because we're all aging and studies have shown that most of us will probably need some sort of long-term care assistance. So it's something that is a very interesting development and you may want to look at what, what had happened or what has happened in Washington and how they um, addressed um, long-term care insurance. Um, <clears throat> okay, and so Managing your financial information. So I feel kind of silly telling this to a financial group because I'm sure you're all very organized. But um, just something to keep in mind is, you know, how how do you manage your passwords? You know, that's the first question. Um, the second question is, do you have a current list of all your assets and debts? So I make all of my clients do this actually. <laughs> so. Um, in, in the binder, they have a current list of all assets and debts with at least the last four digits of the account. If it's a beneficiary-driven asset, the name of the primary and contingent beneficiary, the contact information of the company, the phone number, any other information that can be helpful. This has been amazing because when someone passes away and they've kept it updated, guess what? It's not so hard for the trustee because they have a current list. The mistake that a lot of people make, and I've, I've had cases where someone passes away and the trustee comes in with a banker box. I always cringe <laughs> when I see them walking in with that banker box or like a huge bag and it's just a mess. I mean, just, and it gives me a headache. So I think it's, it behooves you just to take a little bit of time, and you've probably already done this, but just to make sure that you have a current list of all your assets and debts. And that would include, you know, if you have a safe deposit box, 
where is your safe deposit box? Put that on there. Who has the key? Now, your trustee, if they're not the signer on the, the, the safe deposit box, they can access it. They have to wait 40 days. Um, they do need the key. But if they don't have the key, they can get it rekeyed. That's not, you know, the end of the world. But it, it's helpful to have, you know, those types of things for your trustee. And I think, you know, ultimately you want your trustee, you want to make your trustee's life as easy as possible. You know, that's the goal. You want it to make it as seamless as possible because they're grieving plus having to figure out all these little details. It, it can really cause a lot of heartache. So that's my tangent there. Um, so, and then the other question is, where do you file your statements? Do you file them digitally? Do you file them physically? You know, having a system, making sure that your trustee would know how to find those. And then lastly, um, you know, do you have a list of all your electronic payments? I know all of us, you know, we all have those, you know, they get automatically debited. It makes life so easy. It's wonderful. But I would suggest that you make a list of those because I, I see the mistake where people come in and we're starting the trust administration process and you you can't necessarily access the bank accounts right away. You have to wait those 40 days. And so they don't know, well, how's the mortgage being paid? Where is that? What account is that coming from? And they can't really get that information for a little bit of time and it causes stress. And then they try to call the mortgage company and half the time, you know, they, they're not willing to give them much information. So I think it's really important to have a list of all those electronic payments. And the side benefit is when you have a list of all those, then you can review those and say, oh, do I really need this one? Do I really need Netflix? Do I really, need, you know, then it makes you look at all the ones that you have. And then it's a good way for you to audit what you have and, and maybe change things. So um, I would suggest making a list of those as well. Um, the other thing that we typically need um, you know, when someone passes away or they're incapacitated and you're handling their taxes, it's really helpful to have the last three tax returns. So I think it's important to manage those as well and have a place, you know, where those can be easily found as well. And then, of course, any other financial information. Um, I know you've all heard the story of the man who had the cryptocurrency password he couldn't find. He can't access the millions of dollars. And so it's important to you know, keep all those types of, you know, any other types of financial information organized and having a system. But on the other hand, it's a little scary because you don't want, you know, you have to make it secure as well. So that's a process of, you know, maybe having an unlocked cabinet or, you know, if you do keep everything online, you know, having, using one of those systems where, your trusted person can access it upon your death or upon incapacity. So it is a little complicated, but um, you know the the important point and and my my advice is to come up with a system that you know will work for your trustee and for your agents. Um, next is social media. Um, I put this in because I, I often ask clients and they look at me like I'm crazy, but, you know, if, if something happened to you, you know, would you want your pages memorialized or would you want them deleted? Um, and, and especially with Facebook, a lot of my clients are very active on Facebook and it's interesting. I I'll get about half and half response. Some, some want their page memorialized and they have, named a person who's going to continue posting and give updates to all their um, individuals they're connected to. Some people just want their page deleted. Um, so it's important for folks to kind of know what to do um, because if they don't, then um, you know they're just guessing what you would want. And maybe, you know, and it's a very personal thing. Maybe you would not want it memorialized. Maybe you would just want it deleted. And so you know, making that choice beforehand, it just makes it easier and documenting it and making sure that they know what to do is, is really crucial. And then of course, if you have one of these accounts, like a, you know, a viral YouTube channel, I, I had a client who had a viral one. I mean, you know, one of those that make a lot of money, you know, that, then that's important to make sure you have a plan in place so that, you know, that can continue the, the assets from that can continue to your beneficiaries.
So that's just something to think about and, um, you know, something that you may want to include in your plan um, just so, you know, people don't have to guess. That's the big goal. You don't want people to have to guess what you would want because a guess is exactly that. It's a guess. Yeah. Okay. I know I'm going through this kind of quickly. Um, the next section has to do with health information. And I know you're probably wondering, why do I talk about health information? Well, that really kind of intersects with everything else that we do. So, um, you know, if you needed some sort of long-term care, you need, you know, finances to pay for that. You need money to pay for that. It's, it's, it's a holistic kind of way of looking at your life details. So I divided it into two parts, your present health information and your possible future health information. The future health information, quite frankly, that's much more difficult to think about. So we're gonna start with the present. Um, I would suggest that you keep a list of all your medications, you keep a list of all your doctors, your specialists, your dentist. And then what I do is um, for each family member, I keep a medical file with all the current medical information, including notes, treatments, medical history. Because you know, when you go to a new doctor, they always ask you about your medical history. And it's such a hassle when you have to remember that. Whereas if you have that all documented already, what I do is I just take my folder in, I can easily fill it out or I type it, you know, I have it typed up and I can just hand that to the doctor and it's done. I don't have to try to remember all the surgeries or everything that's ever happened in my life. You know, I have it all documented already and it makes life easier. And then the, the side benefit of that is say that you're incapacitated, you know, say that, you know, you're in a coma and the doctor's asking about, you know, have you had a surgery? Have you had this? What has happened? It would be so much easier for your agent to just be able to say, oh, here's their medical record. Here's their medical history. I'm sorry, medical history. They can easily look at, you know, what has happened medically in your life and it, it would make it easier for the doctor. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's important to keep those types of things organized. <clears throat> um, the next one, and it, it, this is always tough for clients, is, you know, we're talking about future medical care. Um, now, if you do have Kaiser um, and you're planning on staying with Kaiser, you may wish to use their Kaiser life care planning packet. So they have their own form. And it has information on, you know, end of life instructions, on organ donation. It has all those questions in this like 20 page packet. So you could decide to use that one, or you could decide to use a regular advanced healthcare directive. So if you do not have Kaiser, you would use an advanced healthcare directive. You know, I strongly recommend everyone on this call, you know, they all those documents are online. There's there's a lot, there's a statutory advanced healthcare directive through through CalBar, you can get it through there. I think everyone over the age of 18 should have one and they're they're pretty easy to, to fill out and notarize. Um, with that document, um, you will need to pick agents. So your agent is extremely important. This is the person who will make healthcare decisions for you and coordinate your healthcare decisions if you're incapacitated. So this needs to be a person who can handle a lot of stress, first of all, can handle family members who may have different opinions about what should happen, and who can make calm, rational decisions. So it's important that you pick agents who fit that criteria. Now, the person that you pick for the advanced healthcare directive, oftentimes, I would say about 80% of the time, is different from the person who's your trustee or financial power of attorney because it's really a different skill set. You know, someone who can handle your finances may not be so great handling your health care management. That they're different health, you know, they're different skill sets. So it's important to consider who is best for the job. So I have clients, and, and this always happens when you have multiple children, and they'll say, well, you know, my older child would never have the patience to be the healthcare directive, but would be wonderful handling finances. So you want to 
make sure that the proper person has been named in the proper roles. And oftentimes they're different and sometimes they're the same. So, it, it, you know, when I sit down with a client, we really have a discussion about, you know, what's that pers- person like and are they able to handle, what are they able to handle and what do you see them doing well? You know, what, what are their strengths and would they be better in this role or that role and why? And so it's a discussion that I have with them. And with the agents, um, of course, you want to have primaries and you want to have contingents as well. Just like with everything else, I recommend you have at least one. Of course, you have to have one, one primary and have at least two alternates, if not more, but at least have two. And then the other section (laughs) is the end of life instructions. And this can be very emotional and difficult for folks. Um, I have to admit, you know, when I review mine even, and I'm doing my instruction, you know, it's difficult for me. And I talk about this all day long, you know, because it's a hard thing to think about, first of all, and they're hard decisions to make because we don't know what's going to happen to us in the future. So part of the instructions are, you know, if you were on life support, you know, would you want to be on life support and why? And if you are in a permanent, if you are in a permanent vegetative state, would you want to be taken off life support? Would you want a certain number of days to, to pass before taking you off? You know, there's lots of these types of questions. If if hospice was appropriate, would you want them to put you in hospice? Um, hydration, nutrition. You know, would you want hydration, nutrition? Some clients feel, you know, I want hydration, nutrition regardless because I don't want to suffer. Some clients feel, well. I don't need it anyway. I'm in a coma. So it's, there's the whole spectrum. And, you know, that's something that you need to have a discussion about and figure out, you know, what best aligns with your um, values. Um, The other thing is, you know, of course, you know, would you want pain relief? So, you know, oftentimes when we're very ill, you know, they'll give you morphine, but, you know, unfortunately that can cause you to pass away quicker. So would you want pain relief, you know, if you were in that situation? So there's, these are difficult questions to talk about, but making these decisions beforehand and having a plan and having a roadmap for your agent to follow makes it so much easier for the family because the worst thing they can do is guess, you know, you never want you know, you don't want your kids to have to guess, like, oh, I think mom would have wanted that. Well, that's a guess. We don't know that for sure. So documenting it, even though I know it's, it can be stressful and it, it's, it's, you know, it's not the most fun thing to think about, it, it can really help your family. Um, and then organ donation, you know, um, <clears throat> if that's something that you'd want to do, um, make sure that that's documented as well. If it's something that you do not want to do, make sure that that's documented because California actually changed the law about two years ago where if they don't know that you do not want to donate, that they can allow donations. So if you don't want to donate, you want to make it very clear that that is your intention not to donate organs. And then you can also state that you want it, you, you want your organs used for certain purposes. Like, for example, you know, most a lot of people want to transplant. That's the most common thing. But some people do not want their organs used for cosmetic surgery. And so you can put in a, a, you know, you put in information, I do not want my organs used for that. Um, Or if you don't want it used for research, you know, some of us, you know, you don't necessarily want to be a cadaver. You know, some people don't want to use it, you want it used for education or research. So you want to be very specific about the purposes for organ donation as well. I'd like to break in here, Nancy, you have about 10 minutes left, and uh, we have at least five questions in chat. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, And then, um, of course, um, once you get this done, um, you'll want to give a copy to your doctor, um, your primary care physician, and any specialist. Um, If you are with Kaiser, in your medical record, there's a section where you can upload it. Um, It says, I I forget the name of it, but you can upload it to your medical record. And then of course, digital copies, you want digital copies, and then let your agent know where it's located. 
Um, if you do have a physician's order for life-sustaining treatment or a pulsed form, other states it's called other things, but um, this is actually a physician's order. And when you're in a facility, it follows you and they have to follow what's on this um, form and it's always pink. So uh, in California it is. Uh, you will, of course, want to make sure that um, your family has a copy of that as well. Okay. Um, final wishes. Um, now, this is something you don't want your family to guess either. About. <laughs> um, so you'd want to specify that in your advanced health care directive or your life care planning packet. I mean, at least let them know, would you want green burial? Would you want a traditional burial? Would you want cremation? You know, they don't want to have to guess about what to do. Um, that's that's a very stressful situation for a family member. So um, I recommend that you make that known. And then um, also, I really suggest, I don't know if that's online. I really suggest that you prepay for this, um, that it actually decreases the stress for your family. And it, it really, I, I've had clients that come in and their mom or dad did all the pre-planning and it was so much easier for them because basically they had to make one call and everything was taken care of and they could just concentrate on grieving and not having to make all these plans and arrangements. Uh, family archives, um, you're probably saying, why isn't a state planning talk? Planning attorney talking about that. But um, I think it's important to digitize photos. Um, what I like to do, like sentimental items, you know, write, you know, explanation, you know, grandma got this and blah, blah, you know, and, and make it very specific so that they know why this item is very important to your family and what the family history is. And then video, I'm, I'm encouraging my clients to make videos, you know, just like about their family history, about, you know, things that are important to them. I mean, we all want to leave a legacy. I think most people want to leave a legacy. And that's the easiest way to leave a legacy is to have videos and share that with your family. So they know, you know, they have that information after you pass away. And that can be really important for them to have that record. Um, and it, it's, it's a special thing to do. Um, an emergency plan. So um, this is very important, at least have your emergency supplies together. I'm not gonna go through what you need, but of course you can just go to the FEMA website and they have nice lists. There's all sorts of lists you can follow, but I would suggest that you do keep emergency supplies, your garage, your house, your office, You know, have different kits. Um, I talked about the important paper file, the grab and go file. I would make sure to have one of those handy so that you can just you have it all together and you just grab and go. Um, and then special situations like children, if you have minor children, make sure you have an emergency plan. If something happens, you know, have another parent, they're going to go to that other parent or not other parent, but that other person who's going to take care of your child in, in case of an emergency. Um, children with special needs, make sure you have plans in place. And then if you have like a like I have clients up in Sonoma and when those big fires hit, you know, they were scrambling to figure out what to do with all their farm animals. You know, if you have something like that, you know, you need to, to pre-plan for those types of things. So, um, you know, I, this book was kind of a, a, a love letter of sorts um, because I, I looked at all the things that have happened, my clients and my own personal experiences, and I created, um, a checklist basically of what I think is important and what people may want to consider organizing just to make their lives easier and give them peace of mind and more importantly to make your family's lives easier. So when I meet with folks, usually their number one concern is they want to protect their family. They want to make sure that their family is okay if something happens to them. And having going through these steps and these checklists and getting these organized beforehand is tremendous help for your family. So um, that's why I wrote this is just to avoid, you know, future problems.